the next vulnerability we're going to cover is access control, D2. So this is similar if you uh, have taken the web security class. Yes? Okay, so this is similar to the OWASP top 10 uh, in terms of access control in your web app. Same idea for smart contracts. So you could have insufficient access control and authentication checks. You can have insecure methods for doing access control. Uh, you can, we talked about this before, you can have these private internal functions that are only intended to be called from within the contract that are made public and external. And that can cause uh, an exploit to happen. Uh, so this results in unauthorized access, and it, that is an error, but like, I, I don't know the loss, but that's exactly the same as the other one, so I think I copy and, too zealous copying and pasting that one. Okay, so here is a walkthrough scenario. Uh, a smart contract designates the address, which uh, initializes it as the contract owner in some kind of function, initialization function, and this will grant that owner special privileges, such as the ability to withdraw all of the contract's funds. Uh, but the initialization function is not protected and can be called by anyone. Uh, and so this allows anyone to become that owner of the contract and then take all of the funds. Um, so here's an example from a couple years ago. And the Parity wallet uh, is widely, was widely used, uh, still widely, well, not this particular Parity wallet, but the Parity wallet uh, software is being used in a lot of places. So uh, this, was, this happened to the Parity wallet. Um, and with the Parity Wallet, it was possible for someone using the library, the Parity Wallet library, uh, to become the owner of the entire library using the init wallet function because it was exposed. And part of this init wallet function was to set the owner of, of the, uh, the wallet itself. Uh, and this, this particular exploit could have been up to 180 million, but someone saw that this was happening and stole the rest of the balance, uh, so only 30 million was lost instead of uh, the 180, and then they gave the they gave the ether back. So this is an interesting sequence of events. So there are, there are some good people in this world, <laughs> preemptively stealing to give back to to the original owners. Um, okay, so here's some uh, a code example of this. Uh, an initialization. So this is similar to the init wallet. I have this init contract sets the owner to uh, whoever called it, message.sender. And if you look at this thing, what is wrong with it? Well, that's wrong with it. It shouldn't be public. Uh, so this logic is detached from the constructor. So if you did this in the constructor, the constructor can only be called once. So that is the appropriate place. But there are times when you might want to reset the owner. Um, and if you do reset the owner, then you would need to make sure that that call is protected. Um, and so anyone can call this init contract, even though you had intended it to only be called once. And then they can become the owner. Uh, so here is the Parity Wallet uh, library example, and it's a little more involved. It's not as simple as some of these examples, but I'm going to walk through it just because I think there's just enough here to understand. Um, so the Parity Wallet library, it's, it was, is basically deployed to implement common wallet functions. And the initializer uh, of this wallet allowed you to specify withdrawal limits and the owner. So this is the, the limit of withdrawals on the, on the, uh, the wallet itself and the, the initialization of the owners of that wallet. And the library was implemented as an, uh, an external contract that other wallets could call into. And the reason why it did this was to reduce costs because they didn't want this library to be copied and pasted in a bunch of different wallet implementations so that you would be forced to run this code. Instead, it, it, it said, you know what, I'm going to put my wallet at this address and allow people to call into the code. It's like, like any library, reentrant library code that you would have uh, in, in a computing system. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this thing called delegate call so that a wallet contract can call delegate call to call into 
the internal functions of this wallet library. And I haven't really discussed this, but this is a function dispatch call. It's like, I have a function that I want to call in that library. I'm going to use delegate call to say, delegate this call into this other contract and execute the code that that contract has to implement that shared function that I want. Okay. Um, and so the, here is an example. Um, function is owner. I am going to just delegate this call, um, the whatever message data. So this is a function call. And I'm going to use this function call, and I'm just going to forward it to the wallet library, is, is what it is. So maybe I don't have this function uh, uh, implemented in my own wallet, but by calling this, then I'm going to call the equivalent function in the wallet library, is, is this piece of code. Uh, this is the only place I'm going to show you delegate call, just to explain this exploit. Um, but the issue in, this, in, in these wallets were, was in the fallback function. So the way this got implemented is that if you receive, so if you remember the fallback function, for any function that gets called which doesn't match the function signature of your contract, you, you send it to the fallback function. So if you're trying to call a library function in this wallet, so if you're trying to call into the wallet, and the wallet is going to take that function call and delegate it to the, to the library, well, then the way you would do that is in the fallback function. You would say, hey, this function invocation doesn't match anything I have. I'm going to have to send that off to the wallet library because it must be a call to the wallet library. And so this is what, uh, this is what most of these wallets were doing. If it got money into the wallet, then it would just deposit that money. If it got a call that had a function signature that it did not recognize, then it just assumed that it was a delegate call to call into library code. So that's, that's the um, implementation. So I'm going to take the message data, which is what the function call invocation is stored in, like the, the, the four bytes of the hash uh, are given in message data of the, of the function call, and then you just fork that off to the, to the wallet library. So that was the implementation of these wallets. Uh, and then the problem with this delegate call solution is that every single public function in the wallet library is now callable through this fallback function. So if the wallet has included that library, it now has exposed all of the library's function calls that are public to any adversary. So you have to make sure when you're including that library that you are okay with any wallet or any user calling all of those functions. Um, uh, and then this leads to a, so if you looked at the init wallet, or was the init wallet? If you looked at this, this is public. It didn't say, it didn't say uh, internal on this thing, right? So this is callable by anybody. It's public. So this is why when somebody calls delegate call on your wallet information and then uses the init wallet, they can actually set the owner to themselves. So that's basically what happened. Um, so this leads to this transaction, and if you click on it, this is the transaction that the person called to own all of the ether uh, in that wallet contract. And then the next one is the transfer of that ether back out just because you expose that library uh, and the init wallet function in that library. So I just wanted to get, give you a gist of it. Uh, the, the examples you're going to work with are much simpler, uh, but that's, that's the idea. Okay, here's another code vulnerability, Metacoin. Uh, for ex purchasing and exchanging coins, um, it has a send coin call to do, uh, uh, to do transfer from the message sender to receiver. So I want you to take a look at this. It's got a balances, keep track of the token balances. This is the send coin function. Uh, you're going to send from yourself. The implicit thing is uh, you are the sender. Uh, and then you're specifying the receiver. You're specifying the amount to send to the receiver. Uh, and if, if the, uh, the amount that you have is less than the balance, then you, you can't do it. Otherwise, you do this transfer from yourself to the receiver with that amount. And do transfer is here, and it updates your balances. 
So what is the problem with, with this code? Uh, no safe math, yep. That's the bonus vulnerability, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yes, transfer is not internal. And moreover, if you look at transfer, it doesn't validate anything, right? So I could just call that with whatever addresses I want, and it will do the transfer. It will update the balances. So yeah, transfer is not set to internal, so it can, call, it can be called externally. And then, uh, because this check would have prevented a rogue transfer, right? Like you have to own, you have to be the message sender um, on this one. Okay. So there's no check. And then the bonus vulnerability is the underflow and the overflow on the balances. Uh, so, excellent. You got both of those. Um, here's another, so same contract. Here's another error. It's like, you know, I don't really do strong authentication here because I'm, I'm, I'm holding money in this contract and money is important to me. So I'm gonna protect this with a, a super secret password. Uh, so what is the error in this? Uh, I'm gonna make sure that when you call my function, you're gonna have to give me a password that's equal to that secret password, yeah. The blockchain is public. So not only do I see this thing in the blockchain, I see every single call to mint new coins, and as soon as I see a password going across the wire, I can just look at the transaction of the last administrator who called mint new coins, and the password is sitting right there, right? So yeah, that's not so good. But it was in this contract. So this is why like buying stuff in contracts, super sketchy. Uh, at least I think so. Um, okay, so yeah. So find your secret password and then just mint as many coins as you can. Okay, so everything is public by design, the contract code, the storage, and the, the transaction contents. So you can just look at the last mint new coins uh, if you're not running a, a full node. Uh, yeah, and this private modifier does nothing for secrecy, so don't conflate the two. Okay, so uh, remediation for this vulnerability. Uh, remove all catch-all function dispatchers. Specify exact calls allowed. So when you saw that fallback function that was just doing the straight up delegate call, you would want to check the function signature hashes of the calls that you want exposed in that library is the solution to that one. Ensure that all the calls that you want to be uh, uncallable externally are labeled internal. Um, Validate the identity before execution using uh, modifiers uh, and require statements. Um, so here's an example. Uh, I have an unprotected contract uh, with a broken change owner, uh, which sets the owner to whatever uh, the person specifies and it's public. So you want to protect that function. So in order to protect it, you want to build a modifier that says only owner, and I'm going to set the message sender to the or I'm gonna check to see if the message sender is the owner before calling it. I'm gonna set the owner to the message sender, and then I'm going to change this change owner function to add the modifier only owner. So this is a pattern you should have in your smart contracts if you have something, some protected uh, functionality that only an administrator should implement, okay? So then, the next two levels, uh, which I'll have you do, is 3.4 and 3.5. So here's 3.4, it's called Piggy Bank. Um, and again, we have this co uh, contract, Charlie's Piggy Bank, and only Charlie can withdraw money from this Piggy Bank. So this, uh, this is gonna be really hard to exploit. Uh, it knows when you get into this level, this is Charlie's address, and it knows that your address is not equal to Charlie's address, so you're not allowed. And uh, if you click, I'm definitely Charlie, let me withdraw, it says, not gonna happen because your address doesn't match. Uh, but again, that's front end. 
uh, contract functions can be called directly. And so you have to go and check to make sure that the backend contract is also doing proper access control. And so uh, to take a look at the, the contract source, uh, this is the piggy bank contract that the uh, Charlie's piggy bank is derived off of. So this is the base class. Uh, it initializes the owner as the sender of the contract, and then it adds to the piggy bank balance the amount that you instantiated the level with. So I think it's like 0.5 ether on this one. Um, so that is the constructor. Um, and then if you add money to the piggy bank uh, through the fallback function, it just adds to the balance. It also has an only owner modifier to ensure that only the owners can access certain functions. So I've done the right thing. I said, you know, I'm gonna make sure only owners can do uh, certain functions. I'm going to have a withdraw function that is only callable internally. So I protected it. Uh, and if it's called with a certain amount, then I will subtract from the piggy balance that amount using safe math. And then I'll transfer to the sender that amount. Uh, now this thing is going to be called only from collect funds. So then I have collect funds and it's only the owner who can call this. And this is the external, uh, this is externally callable. So again, this looks good too, uh, that only the owner can withdraw money and in particular only Charlie. So Charlie is the owner of this contract, uh, presumably. And then I'm going to require that the amount that they're trying to withdraw is less than or equal to the piggy balance. Uh, so that seems okay. And then I allow this withdraw to happen. So this seems pretty secure. Um, I want to create, so this level creates a modified version of this called Charlie's Piggy Bank Contract. And it's going to extend Charlie's Piggy Bank with one thing. It's going to add a counter to keep track of the amount of times Charlie has, has withdrawn money. So I'm going to extend the piggy bank contract. So I say, Charlie's piggy bank is an instantiation of the piggy bank. I'm gonna add a withdrawal count. Uh, I'm gonna set it to zero. And then when I do this collect funds call, I'm going to add one to the withdrawal count and then withdraw the amount. So this overrides the collect funds of, of the original piggy bank contract, but is there an error? Have I done this correctly? Or is there a problem with this call? It doesn't have only owner. Doesn't have only owner. So there you go. The, the, the typo. Uh, this collect funds is protected. This thing, which overrides the original, did not retain the only owner modifier. So then anybody can call collect funds. Uh, and so even though the web UI is making this great check, the contract itself, because it omitted this only owner, um, can, uh, can be exploited. So you can use my crypto. I use my crypto for this. Uh, you access the contract using the ABI. Uh, you scroll down and examine the ABI calls to interact with the contract. Uh, and then you just withdraw the amount directly. So it's 0.15 ether on this particular one. Okay, so that one's really easy. Uh, the next one is secure bank. Uh, this is the simple bank. It, uh, this is the base class. It implements a bank for depositing and withdrawing ether, and it's done with a balances mapping. So this maps the address of the account to the amount of ether it has. Uh, the constructor will initialize the balance for the sender. So in this case, the, the contract creator gets the, the balance of the level instantiation. So that's what you start with. Uh, you have a withdraw function that takes a user and it takes an, a value. It makes sure that the amount you're going to withdraw is less than your balance. And then if it is, then it will deduct that value from the user. So it's check this, so it's, it's okay. It doesn't have to use safe math on that one. And then it does the transfer uh, to you. And then it's got a, uh, a payable fallback function for any deposits. So that looks reasonable. Uh, there is a member's bank that's derived from this simple bank contract. Uh, it adds restrictions because you don't want anybody to use your bank. You want only members to use your bank, uh, hopefully paying members. And so member's bank is derived from the simple bank. 
and it uses a mapping that says for every address, I'm going to register a string to that address that registers a username for all of the valid members. Um, so this allows, this f uh, call allows you to, given an, uh, an address, create a username so that it sets the mapping members underscore user to that username. And that registers a user. And then it creates a modifier to make sure only members, only addresses who have an entry in this members mapping uh, can access. So that's what this is member modifier. It, it basically pulls for an address, it pulls the string associated with that address as the username. And if the username is not equal to zero, uh, then it That should be equal to zero. It doesn't matter though. That so this, <laughs> this modifier. Uh, yeah, I think that's a bug. But anyway, um, the withdraw function is here, and it forces you to be a member of this uh, of this. Uh, members bank in order to do the withdrawal. Okay. Okay, so are there any issues with this particular uh, contract, do you think? Yeah. Yeah, you could put an existing user. You can overwrite the username of someone else's uh, account. That is one. That that is one of one of the biggest issues here. So the register, the register function isn't protected. Okay. Um, um, the other. So in order to make this uh, account, uh, this contract more secure, there's a secure bank contract that is derived from members bank. Um, it ensures that only owners of an account can invoke a withdrawal on it. So if you look at the other contracts, um, the withdraw the withdraw can happen without you being the message sender. That's a problem, right? So you want only the message sender to be able to withdraw money. Uh, so uh, in this case, we're going to make sure that the user is the message sender. So the other one was insecure. It allowed anyone to do the withdrawal. Uh, and also, I'm going to put some limits on the withdrawal. It has to be less than 100 and greater than 1. And then I can call the, so super is calling the base class withdrawal in order to do the withdrawal for this, uh, this secure bank. Okay. Uh, and then with register, register is still insecure. Uh, so it still has the issue where anybody can do the register. And it's doing some length checks. So what you don't want to have happen um, is when you register a member, you don't want to have to, like if someone gives a, an enormous string to you, you can, you can cause a little bit of a denial of service attack on the contract by registering a, a, an enormous string into that contract. So this thing has, uh, has required the length of the username to be limited. Okay. So the two vulnerabilities here are that the username uh, mapping to the user address uh, is insecure. So the user is not guaranteed to be the message sender when you do the register. So that's a big thing. Anybody can register an address, uh, can register a username to, to any address. Um, and that can make them a member even though they don't own the address. So this is the, uh, the derived classes register. And then that will call the base class's register to register a username. At no point does it check to see if the message sender is the user. OK. So issue number two, we're going to play a game. Uh, and this is the game we're going to play. One of these things is not like the other. So here, is, here are all three withdrawal functions. Here is simple bank's withdrawal. Um, it's checking to make sure you have enough money, or the user has enough money. Uh, before doing the deduction. Here is the member bank withdraw to make sure that the person is a member of the contract. 
uh, before it does the withdraw. And then here is the secure bank uh, withdraw. It checks to make sure the sender and the account match. And hopefully with these three withdraws, you'll end up with something that's uh, super secure. So what is, what is wrong with this? Which one is not like the other? If we're playing that game and why? Yep. So value is an, a uint 256 here, a uint 256 here, and a uint 8 here. So in this case, if the function signatures are exactly the same, then you will inherit. But if the function signature differs by anything, like this parameter differs, then you'll get a separate call a separate function call called withdraw. So that's the vulnerability, okay? So you can call this, uh, you can call this directly without having gone through this. So the intent was for you to call this, and this is protected, message sender is equal to user, so this prevents you from calling these two directly. But if this has got a uint8, then you can call these two directly. Right? So then the vulnerability that Secure Bank was trying to fix is now exploitable. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, and you will see, when you get into My Crypto, you'll see multiply labeled withdraw functions. Because one has a uint8 as a second parameter, and one has a uint256. So you want to call the uint256 version because the uint8 is actually going to check to see if you're the legitimate owner of that balance, but the other two aren't. So this is one of the reasons why this inheritance, the complexity involved in trying to manage what is going on in this contract using inheritance, this is why they got rid of it in Viper, which is going to be at the, after we're done doing all these levels, you'll, you'll understand uh, very viscerally why they don't do this kind of stuff uh, in, in smart contracts. Well, they, they'd like to avoid it at least. Okay, so multiple withdrawal calls are available due to the function signature mismatch. So you can call members banks withdraw and make sure, because it doesn't check to see if the message sender is equal to the user. Um, and so this is what you'll see in the interface. You'll see multiple withdrawal functions. Uh, that have different parameter checks. And when you click on one, it will, it will say right here which type value is. So you want the 256 type. If you, if you click on one and it says uint8, that's not the one you want because it's going to check the sender. Okay, so the, in order to get by the members bank check though, we have to register a username onto the owner of the ether that we're trying to steal from. And so that is the, the initial deployment of the contract gives the ether to the contract launcher as part of the constructor. So we have to figure out the address of the contract launcher. And if you click on your, your contracts, the, the level contracts transaction, you can see that the contract is created by this address. Uh, so with this, you can register, you can check the balance of that address. And this is, so it was instantiated with 0.4 ether. So this is the level launcher and the level launcher has a balance of 0.4 ether. So what we want to do is we want to register a name to this uh, account, to this address, and then we want to steal all of its ether is, is the exploit. So the first thing to do is to register a username onto that uh, contract address so it passes the members bank te uh, test. And then you can withdraw all of its balance via the base classes, the members bank version of the withdraw function that doesn't check to see if the message sender and the user are the same. Okay, so, the, so that's what I do. I register the contract uh, launcher address as uh, under my username, and then I, I pull all the money out. Okay, so those are the three levels that I want you to do right now. Uh, hopefully you can get through, how much time do we have? And maybe you'll get through a couple of them at least, but that's, that's basically what I'm going to have you do for the rest of the, rest of the time. 
Okay, so today I'm going to start with um, a lab that I wanted to walk through last class, but I forgot to. Um, uh, lab 3.5 is uh, this raffle contract, uh, and it's a combination of two vulnerabilities. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to walk through it for you to, to complete this lab. Uh, so the raffle ticket contract, you buy a raffle ticket, and then when the raffle closes, the contract is going to randomly choose a winner, a winner of the, uh, the raffle. So this is the contract. Uh, there is a fee, which is the ticket price, which is uh, 0.1 ether at the, at the top. Uh, there is a winning ticket. Uh, so the, where's the winning ticket? The winning ticket, which is going to be uh, the number that's going to get randomly selected, and then if you match that winning ticket, you'll get the get the prize. Uh, there's a ticket number mapping. So every time you buy a ticket, uh, uh, as a user, you get to record what your ticket number uh, is, and that's what this mapping is. This ticket ticket number mapping, uh, and then there's a potential winner mapping. So uh, this potential winner, only the people who have not closed the raffle can be a winner. So this is to prevent some collusion where like, I'm going to close the raffle and because I know when I'm going to close the raffle, I have an advantage that I can actually try and predict what the winning raffle ticket number is. So there's this mapping that'll just disqualify you if you decide to close the raffle. And this will become important because that's one of the vulnerabilities uh, here. And uh, so the constructor uh, puts, there's a rewards mapping as well, and this keeps track of um, how much money each particular individual has in this contract. Uh, so whenever you buy a ticket, uh, you, you add money to your, your rewards mapping. So in this case, the constructor gets uh, instantiated with the initial level value, which is like 0.3 ether. So that's how much, this is your jackpot. And the jackpot is associated with the address of the raffle contract, okay? Uh, the, the first function uh, to look at in this contract is the buy ticket uh, function. And this function does a bunch of bookkeeping that you would expect a raffle contract to do. Uh, it clears out the winning ticket to be zero. Uh, all the time. Anytime uh, anyone buys a ticket, it just resets the winning ticket uh, so that it can be selected randomly. Um, uh, it has this block number variable, and what this block number variable does is that it wants to make sure you can't buy a ticket and close the raffle in the exact same block, because then you could programmatically try and do something. Uh, so that's what this number keeps track of. And then the number of tickets bought, uh, it's just a variable. Whether or not the raffle has been stopped. So anytime someone buys a ticket, you want to make sure the raffle is still going. Um, uh, when someone buys a ticket, you add to the rewards mapping from the sender the, the value that uh, the, the ticket is, is worth. And then you uh, select a ticket number for this uh, the purchaser of the ticket. So you set in this mapping, and in this case, you set it to the amount of money the person has sent minus the fee, which is going to be uh, 0.1 ether, and then divided by 10 to the eighth, because this is going to be done in way, or is effectively what's going on. So you actually, as the sender, you can choose your ticket number. In, is what this logic is allowing you to do. And then you are a potential winner because you didn't close the raffle. Uh, so you can potentially win this raffle. So it's trying to make things fair. Uh, so yeah, so this is, this is one of the key things to note is that this ticket number, you get to choose your ticket number based on this difference divided by 10 to the 8. Okay. Uh, the other thing that you can, uh, someone can do is close the raffle. Um, and the first thing close raffle does is that it, or one of the things that it does, is that it, uh, it sends, it sets whoever closes the raffle, it sets the potential winner uh, mapping to false. So they're not allowed to win uh, money 
if, the, if they've closed it. Uh, and then it also calculates this winning ticket. And the way the winning ticket is calculated, it's the four bytes of the block hash of the last block a ticket was purchased on. So you recall, and when you buy the ticket, you set this thing. So the last uh, buy ticket event will set the block number, and then when someone closes this raffle, the block number, uh, that block number, the hash of that block number will be set to the winning ticket. Okay, and then you can say the raffle stop is true. Um, one of the thing, one of the require statements is to make sure that the block number is the current block number is always greater than that variable uh, that was last purchased. So you can't close the raffle at the same time you've purchased the ticket. Okay. Uh, is there something wrong with how winning ticket is calculated? And if so, what is wrong with it? Based on what you've had in this class so far. If you recall, it was, it's sort of like trivia. Uh, eventually it does. Okay. <laughs> so we did see that the block hash of the current block number is always zero because you don't know the hash of a block you know it's number. So when you are sitting there uh, executing, block.number is your current block number. You know that, but you don't know the ultimate hash of that block number because the, the minor has to be, like the winning minor has to be part of the block. So the hash is part of the winning minor. So you, the block hash of the current block number is not known. Uh, the other thing that is uh, not known, well, it's known, but it's not kept, is that if this is more than 256 blocks old, this also returns zero. So that was the other piece of when we talked about, that's why it's D2, D6, because there's bad randomness here, where you're thinking that this should always return something random, or it should be at least part of the block hash that's, that's pretty random. But in fact, at, when this thing is 256 blocks old, it, this, this, is, uh, this block hash returns zero. So that is one vulnerability, okay? But doesn't it require the block number not to be zero? So if you choose a block that's over 256 away, wouldn't that violate the required? Is uh, the third required thing? Uh, the third, so your current block number is greater than that last ticket purchase. So this require forces you to call close raffle at least one block after the right, buy so ticket. Oh, the block number won't be zero because you know the you you definitely know your current block number. What you don't know is the hash. That's oh, okay. that's the thing. Yeah. The block is always a number, but the hash of a really old block number is zero. And the hash of your current block number is zero because you don't know it yet because you don't know the minor. So those are the two things that this is getting at. So you think it's random and unguessable, but in fact. Uh, because of the way Ethereum is, the, the implementation, you've got this problem that might not be obvious. Obviously, it's not obvious to all contract writers, uh, but this is a piece of trivia you have to know if you're writing a smart contract on Ethereum, um, at least right now. Um, okay, so that's, that's one of the vulnerabilities. Um, the next thing is this collect reward function. Um, and this thing is, if this, this is your payout. So it can only be called um, after the close raffle has been called because there is this raffle stopped, this require that makes sure that the raffle is stopped. And then you can only collect the reward if this is true, you're a potential winner. So this means that anyone who closes the raffle can't, can't take this money. Um, and then if the, both of these hold and you hold a winning ticket, uh, then you get the entire reward of the not only the, the ticket that you purchased, but you get the reward associated with the contract. So you get that initial pot that the contract was instantiated with, okay? Um, and then it sets the rewards to, to zero. Okay. Uh, the next thing in this contract is a payable fallback function. So if you have ether and you send it to the fallback function, it's going to assume if the money that you send is greater than or equal to the fee that you want to buy a ticket. 
And then it uses the this notation to buy the ticket. And we'll talk about the difference between this dot something and, and just calling buy ticket directly. Uh, the other thing that it does is if no ether is sent to the fallback function, it will automatically close the raffle. Or it will try to close the raffle. Um, and so the, um, uh, the last thing is that if you uh, send it something in between, it will try and collect the reward. Um, I don't think this is actually needed. Um, one of the things that is different between the this.closeRaffle and then just calling close raffle directly is that when you call close raffle directly, message.sender is whoever sent you money to the fallback function. That gets forwarded as if it was just a function call. If you use this notation, the, the this dot close raffle, the actual sender, message dot sender, turns into the address of the contract itself. So those are the two differences between just calling close raffle directly and then saying, you know what, I'm going to invoke myself. The contract is going to invoke itself, in which case message dot sender, so if I send this contract, this fallback function, uh, uh, zero ether, Rather than using my address to close the raffle, it will use the contract's address to close the raffle. And this is how we get to the point where you can close the raffle without disqualifying yourself, um, is, is the, the idea. So this is an access control problem where you haven't figured out how addresses work, and you call this thinking that it will retain the message sender, when in fact it will replace the message sender with the contract address. So those are the two vulnerabilities in this contract that you're going to exploit. Okay, so let's walk through how to exploit this. You do a buy ticket uh, using my crypto. You call buy ticket using my crypto, and you, ex you send exactly what will get you zero. Because if the block hash of that old block is gonna give you zero, then you want your winning ticket to be zero. And the way you get your winning ticket to be zero is to send the contract exactly the fee. And then when you have fee minus fee, it'll give you a ticket of zero. So that's what this does. Uh, zeros out your winning ticket, or your, your ticket number. Uh, and then you wait 256 blocks. So in this case, my block number is 5689703. I have to wait till 5689958. And then that, within the contract, that block hash of block num will end up being zero after those 256 blocks. Um, make sure you don't buy any additional tickets while you're waiting because that'll update the block number. And then you have to wait another 256 blocks uh, to, to close the raffle. Okay, uh, the other thing you have to do is you're gonna do this, uh, the this.close raffle. In order for the contract to be able to call itself, it has to be an authorized sender. So when we talked about uh, launching these level contracts, the authorized sender is the launcher and then the, the player address. But in this case, we're trying to call the fallback function from, uh, you, we're trying to call the close raffle from within the same contract's fallback function. So you have to authorize, the, you have to find the contract's address and then add it to its own authorized sender. Uh, so that's, that's what this, this is doing, okay? Uh, and then after you do this, you can send zero to the contract's fallback function, zero ether, and that will uh, force the contract to, to issue the this.close raffle um, and set the message sender to the contract address so that you, it doesn't disqualify your wallet from winning the raffle. Uh, you can see that the raffle has stopped. So if you copy the raffle ABI, you get the raffle contract. Uh, you can then read the raffle stopped variable and, it's, and you can see that it's true. And then you, from your wallet, you can directly call collect reward. Uh, and then when you do the collect reward, you should win. You should get, oh, I, this is a three ether uh, contract. So that is uh, a walkthrough of Raffle and um, how to exploit it. Are there questions about this? Okay. Um, one of the things I wanted to show you is that you can solve this level 
by writing another contract. So here's an interface to raffle, buy ticket, close raffle, collect reward. You don't actually need the skim, skim a little off the top. That's part of the, the contract for the raffle uh, uh, owner. Um, and this is the contract. Uh, you have the contract here, assuming uh, you've added the raffle contract address as its own authorized sender. So if this is your address, uh, then what you can do is you can do the buy and the mess you set the, uh, uh, the, the buy is payable and you want to make sure you're sending at least 0.1 ether uh, and then you buy the ticket using that 0.1 ether. Uh, the close function will call the fallback function with zero ether and that will uh, cause close raffle to, to run. Uh, you can have a collect one that just collects the reward and then get money out of the attacking contract by self-destructing and then sending it to yourself. So. However you want to solve it, it's up to you. You could do it multiple ways. Okay, so I'm going to stop there.